All right, so keep your place there in 2 Samuel chapter 24. So we're going to look at this story, and you're also going to need to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So we're going to be looking at this story from the perspective of 1 Chronicles 21, which also tells this same story in the Bible. So 1 Chronicles and 2 Samuel line up with a lot of the same stories in the Bible. So we're going to look at this. Um, it's kind of like the Gospels. You know, we get different perspectives um, from different um, parts in the Bible. And before we get into the story, let me just say this. When it comes to uh, people, you know, we're King James only in this church. And when it comes to people who have, you know, ideas that the King James Bible contradicts itself in certain places. So I, in order to hit all those places in the Bible and explain those, I would have to have a sermon series that was several sermons long. So what I've been doing over the last year is whenever we get to a story that has one of these supposed contradictions in the Bible, um, I just kind of explain it as part of the sermon. So there's three of them in this story that we're going to explain tonight. So tonight's going to be kind of a Bible study um, along with um, this train wreck that we're going to look at in the Bible. So first I need you to turn to James chapter 1 and verse number 13. So we might have to put your thinking caps on just a little bit tonight and uh, let's just learn some of the Bible together. Turn to James chapter 1 and look at verse number 13. So I want to just introduce this idea for you before we get into the story in the Bible. But the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse number 13, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, evil, neither tempteth he any man. So the Bible says that if you are tempted to sin, if you are being you know, tempted in your life to sin, which you're going to be many times, that that temptation to sin does not come from God. Amen. Okay. Now, look at... 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse number 1. Look at 2 Samuel 24 and verse number 1. I want everyone to get there. Keep your place. You're going to need to keep your place in 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21 for some Bible, uh, just some, we're going to be going back constantly between those two chapters, okay? Look at 2 Samuel. Knowing what we just read, that God doesn't tempt you with evil, look at 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So here it says that, you know, God moved David against Israel to say, go number Israel and Judah. So we're going to get into this, but going for David to go and number Israel and Judah was a sin. Okay, and I'm going to explain that to you, but the Bible seems to say here that God, you know, caused David to sin. Okay, so if we had James chapter 1 and verse number 13, and then we read 2 Samuel chapter 20, 24, verse number 1, we might be a little confused. All right, but thank God that we have 1 Chronicles 21 and verse number 1 to explain things for us. So go there. Now, this is the contradiction. People who are, and, and every single time there's a contradiction, quote unquote, in the Bible, it's people that don't, most people that aren't saved, they're surface reading the Bible, and they're missing the deeper things of God. Okay? So I'm going to show that to you now. So look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So we know that God doesn't tempt you with sin. Okay? It's not God that does that. All right? 2 Samuel chapter 24. So just forget you know that for a minute. And let's look at 2 Samuel 24. And let's just be, let's pretend we're unsaved surface reading the Bible here. Okay? 2 Samuel 24 verse 1 says, I mean, I'll read it for you while you're turning to 1 Chronicles 21. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So first of all, the Bible says God's angry with Israel. And it doesn't just say he's angry with Israel. It says, and again, He's angry with Israel. And you're like, about what? Well, about, have you ever read the Old Testament? About the same thing they always are doing. They're always just leaving him. They're always in going, worshiping other gods. They're marrying people from these other tribes. And they're just forgetting about the Lord, is what they're doing. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So look, God's angry with Israel. We know that. He's not happy with them in 2 Samuel chapter 24. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And the Bible says, see, now we get the clarification about what happened, okay, with David. The Bible says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So, look, numbering Israel is a sin, 
All right? So who provoked David to do it? It was Satan. Okay? So you're saying, well, what? Well, it says in 2 Samuel chapter 24 that, that God moved David against them. Well, here's how this works, okay? God does not provoke people to sin. God does not tempt people to sin. Turn to Job chapter 1. A very similar concept happened with Job, okay? Look, the Lord, if Satan does anything, it is because the Lord allows it. Satan operates in this world freely only as God allows it to happen, okay? So everything that Satan does as he goes to and fro to the earth is, is God allowing that to happen. God allows Satan to operate on this earth. And it's not always going to be that way. Those days will come to an end. All right? Look at Job chapter 1 and verse number 12. But the Bible says this in, in Job chapter 1 verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. So Job, or Satan and God are having this argument. And, you know, God is like, have you considered my servant Job? I mean, he's just this super great Christian, and he's serving the Lord, he loves the Lord, his family, you know, is, he's raising his family right, he's doing all these things right. And Satan's like, it's only because he has, he's so successful. It's only because you've just given him everything. It's only because you've just made him super successful. And God's like, okay, well, let's, God allows Satan to test this theory, and God is going to show Satan that Job is truly faithful. And God says, all that he hath is in thy power. God gives him that power. All that he hath, all his stuff, all that he owns, only upon himself put forth, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And of course, Dave, or, uh, Job loses everything. But it was only because, and who took it away from Job? Satan did. Right? Satan took all these things away from Job, but only as far as God allowed it. So anything that Satan does, or Satan is, well, however he is able to operate on this earth is, is through God allowing it to happen. Period. Okay? So look, it was Satan that moved, that basically it was Satan that tempted David to number Israel. But 2 Samuel 24 is showing us that, just, that God was angry with Israel and he removed that protection from David and he just allowed it to happen. It's that simple. I mean, look, there's a reason it says, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. God was angry at Israel again. Proving once again that, you know, if God's angry at a nation, you know, you're just going to have, you're going to have leaders that do stupid things. Once again, proven right here. Even David, right? Even a, a godly leader like David. Okay, so there's contradiction number one, cleared up. All right? So, David numbers the people. Okay? David... Look at 2 Samuel 24, look at verse number 3. David goes to number the people. 2 Samuel 24, look at verse number 3. And the Bible says, And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord God add unto the people how many soever they be, and hundredfold, and the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host, and Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. So Joab, he tries to stop him, right? Joab tries to stop David from committing this sin. Now look, when Joab's trying to like correct you morally, you got problems, all right? I mean, Joab is not the most moral person in the Bible, all right? Joab is known for just doing what he wants to do at the time, but even Joab knows. He's like, whoa! Don't do it. What are you doing? Don't do this. So it was wrong for David to do it. And even it was so wrong that even Joab knew that it was wrong. Turn to Numbers chapter 1. So the question is this. Why was it wrong? He's saying he's just, he's just taking a, a, a census. Okay? Why was it wrong? Look at Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1 and verse number 1, we see another census happen in the Bible. Okay? So look, I mean, censuses, they happen in the Bible. We're going to look at one right here. But there's a difference between this census and the one that David is doing. Okay? Look at Numbers 
chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month and the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation. Who said that? Who said it? The Lord. The Lord commanded this census. From 20 years old and upward that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and thou and Aaron shall number their armies and wish you shall be man of every tribe and every one the head of his house of his father. Look, so God, look, God numbers the people. God took this census. God commanded it to happen. It's his job and he commanded it to happen. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. So first of all, the Lord did not command David's census. The Lord did not command David to go do this. David did it on his own. All right? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. And let's look at um, some other reasons that David, or that David was sinning by taking the census. Look at Deuteronomy 7 and verse number 7. The second point is this. The Lord, the Lord does not need numbers. The Lord doesn't need 800,000 men that carry the sword. Look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. The Bible says, The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the, for ye were the fewest of all people. Look at Judges chapter 7. As a matter of fact, sometimes, I'm, I'm going to show you next, sometimes God doesn't want the numbers. God doesn't want huge numbers. And I'll show you why. Look at Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7 and verse number 2. This is Gideon. He's going to war against the Midianites. And God is preparing him to go to war. And he's got some 30 plus thousand men ready to go to war. Look at verse number 2. And the Bible says in Judges chapter 7 and verse number 2, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why? He's like, you have too many people with you. Why? Well, he explains it. He says, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand hath saved me. <laughs> why, why do you want numbers when you're going to war? Because, I mean, who wants to go to war and lose? Who wants to go to war against 15,000 men with 1,000 people? Who wants to do that? Raise your hand. Nobody. But God said no. He's like, if you go to war against the Midianites with 32,000 men, you might say you won the battle. So what does he say? Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return to the people 20 and 2,000, and there remain 10,000. So look, we have 10,000 and 22,000 were afraid. That means there was 32,000 to begin with. All right? So look. First of all, most were afraid. Most people are cowards. Most of these people, I mean, these were warriors. These were men of war. Most men were afraid. 22,000 of them, two-thirds of them, over two-thirds of them went home. And God told them to go home. So the brave are the few, unfortunately. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. He's like, it's still too many people. He's like, two, he's like, I just lost two-thirds of my army. He's like, too many people. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men, but all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that I lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. Look, he didn't want the numbers. It came with 32,000 people, and God whittles it down to 300 men. I mean, you want to talk about the story of the 300, this is it right here. This is the real story. Okay, These 300 men go up against this army of thousands, and God does it that way so he can say, look, you know what? I'm winning this for you. I don't want you saying, oh, yeah, but we had these 32,000 of the best warriors that ever lived and all this kind of stuff. No, he's like, I'm giving you 300, and I'm going to win, and you're going to know it was me. 
God didn't want the numbers because he knew that the men would be lifted up, that they would be lifted up in the Bible. But David, back to David, go back to 2 Samuel, verse 24. David does it anyway. He does it anyway. He goes and he numbers the people. And then God gives him three choices for punishment. Look at 2 Samuel 24 and verse number 13. The Bible says, so Gad, Gad is the, is the prophet, is the, the voice, the messenger of God here for David, much like Nathan was. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come into thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see whatsoever I shall return to him that sent me. So here's another contradiction. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and let's read the story again from that perspective. So um, we'll go over the contradiction real quickly and then we will go back to the story. So in 2 Samuel chapter 24, Gad comes to David and he says, here's your three choices. You've got seven years of famine. He's like, you're going to have, uh, what does he say, three months. You can flee before your people, you know, much like he fled, you know, at Absalom. And then he says, or, you know, three days pestilence can come into the land. So we got, you know, seven years in, in, Second Chronic, in 2 Samuel 24, you know, three months and three days, basically, are the, the two choices, right? Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Let's look at the story from that perspective. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. So you, you notice that? In, first, in 2 Samuel 24, Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, right? But in 1 Chronicles 21, thus saith the Lord, choose thee either three years famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes while the sword of the enemies overtake thee or three days of the sword, even the pestilence in the land. So which is it? The question is, which is it? Is it turned back to 2 Samuel chapter 21? Which is it? In 2 Samuel 24, it says seven years. But then in 1 Chronicles 21, it says three years. Right? So, I mean, which is it? That's a big difference, right? Look at 2 Samuel 21 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Then there was famine in the days of David three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered and said, It is, it is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. So, three chapters back, we see that they are already in this horrible famine. And it's been three years. Now guess what? Between 2 Samuel chapter 21 and 2 Samuel chapter 24 is about one year. Time. So at the point of 2 Samuel chapter 24, they are already four years into a famine. You see? So look, the answer is it was both. It was both. You know, the exact words of God were spoken in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So basically to break down how the whole situation, the conversation with David went, basically Gad came to him and he said, look, he's like, the Lord said either three years of famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thy enemies overtake thee, or else three days of the sword of the Lord. And then he simply makes the statement somewhere in there that is recorded in 2 Samuel 24, where he says, Shall seven years of famine come into the land? He basically tells him, he's like, Look, the Lord says, pick three years, three months, or three days. Pick. And then he says to them, Gad says to him, Look, do you want seven years of famine in the land? He's like, that will be seven years of famine in the land. Because at that point, they'd already been through four years of famine. To get to that punishment of seven years would be three more years. So look, there's no contradiction. But look, here's the funny thing. You want to find contradictions, go and look at new Bible versions and how they fix these contradictions. Right? I mean, I'm not, I don't want to get too deep into it because I want to get back to the story. But basically, the NIV smartly changes 2 Samuel 24 to three years. And then, you know, 1 Chronicles 21 says three years. Right? But then in 2 Samuel 21, it says three consecutive years. So basically, with the, with the NIV, you lose the fact that there has already been four years of famine going on. You lose that. 
Even though, and here, here's the thing, even though the Bible says, turn to the last part of 2 Samuel chapter 24. What's the last thing that we see in 2 Samuel chapter 24? In 2 Samuel chapter 21, the Bible says, the King James Bible never says that the famine ended. They went and they did this thing where they hung these, these sons, and you know they, they, the Bible says that God was entreated, but it never says that the famine ended. Well, you say, well, what do you, doesn't that mean? No, look what it says at the end of 2 Samuel 24. The Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. Look, he ended it. He ended that plague. He said that he ended that plague that David chose. Right? So look, it just gets all messed up when they try to fix what the Bible actually says. Yeah. Right? So, back to the story. It, I mean, the story's a mess at this point. David has numbered Israel, and he basically, you know, I can't really blame him, but he chooses pestilence, okay? He chooses the three days. I mean, I, you know, I can't really blame him. I'd probably pick, I mean, let's just get it over with. He basically says, you know, smartly, you know, David, think about this. David has been dealing with men his whole life. He's been dealing with fighting evil men his whole life. His own son overthrew his kingdom, and he's been, he's been running from Saul, hiding in the wilderness. He's been running from his own son, Absalom, hiding in the wilderness. And he's just like, he says, man, he's like, I just, just don't let me fall into the hands of man. <laughs> he's like, men are terrible. He's like, men are terrible. Just don't, they have no mercy. He's like, men will just kill you with no mercy. And he's like, just let me fall into the hands of the Lord. He's like, the Lord is merciful. I mean, I like his logic. Especially when you're David, right? Because how does David, I mean, look, did David, did David always do the right things? I mean, look, David made some big mess ups. I mean, this is a big mess up. David makes some big, but how does he respond? I mean, it comes back and they're like, you've got 800,000 men of the sort, which means like you are super powerful. And he's like, I'm in a lot of trouble right away. He's like, I've sinned against the Lord. Look, there's no excuse making with David. He just, he, he just owns that thing right away, every time. I mean, look, he falls on his face, but he gets up and he owns it. He owns it. So he chooses pestilence. It's the quickest punishment. You can't really blame him there. Look at verse 14. And David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. So Gad tells David to go to this threshing floor. And Gad came to David and said to him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. And David, you know, he's to buy, you know, he sees the actual angel of the Lord up there. Okay, he sees the angel of the Lord up there, and he just he goes and he buys the threshing floor. Look at verse 24. And the king sent unto Arana, Nay, but I will, because the guy's like, I'll just give it to you. And he's like, No, he's like, I will buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord thy Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Underline that in your Bible too. So, first of all, let me, there's some contradictions. I mean, names between Chronicles and Kings are different because people just had different names, middle names, different spellings of names. They're just different names many times in the Bible. But that's, that's normal, that's, except those are not contradictions. Okay, it's just different names for different, could be a different translation of that name, you know, from the, the writer of Chronicles to the writer of 2 Samuel. But in 1 Chronicles 21, this man's name is Ornan. Ornan. Okay, so David basically goes to buy this threshing floor so he can make this sacrifice to entreat the Lord. Okay, at, you know, the, at, at Gad's advice. Okay, but look at the price. Here's another contradiction in the Bible. 50 shekels of silver is what he pays in 2 Samuel chapter 24. But look what it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And the David said unto Ornan, this is the same man as Arana, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan the, pr the price for 
gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. So here we have these shekels, and in 2 Samuel chapter 24, he gives 50 shekels of silver. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there a, a difference between the price of silver and gold? I mean, right now, I think an ounce of silver is about 20 bucks, and an ounce of gold is about close to 2,000, I think. Last time I checked. But look, so he gives him 50 shekels of silver, which would equal just to be a few hundred dollars. But he buys, it says, the threshing floor and the oxen in 2 Samuel chapter 24. But in 1 Chronicles 21, it says he buys the place for 600 shekels of gold, which is basically like $400,000. All right, so basically the answer and the, the, uh, the explanation of this is in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, like one chapter over, look at verse number one. Because this place, this place, Ornan's threshing floor, Ornan's farm, basically, has a very special place in the history of the Bible. And look at verse 1 of chapter 22 of 1 Chronicles. The Bible says, Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. So look, was the house of God built yet? Was the temple built yet? No. First Chronicles chapter 22 talks about how Solomon, David's son, will build the temple. So what does David do? He can't build the temple. So what does he do? Does he just sit around? And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. So here, David decides, or David is told, that this is going to be the place of the house of God. And David, nicely, knowing he's told, you're not going to be the one. You spilled too, I've seen you spill too much blood on this earth, God tells David. He's like, you're not going to be the one that builds the temple. He's like, your son, Solomon, is going to build it. But look, he bought all of the land for the temple. And this is the place where the temple was built. In 1 Kings 7 and 8, the Bible talks about there's, it's not just the temple. There's many other buildings that were there. I don't know how many tens of acres or a hundred acres or whatever this was. I'm sure people have theories. The Bible doesn't really tell us. But look, this is a large chunk of land here. So in 2, Chron or 2 Samuel chapter 24, we see what he paid for the oxen and for the threshing floor itself. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, we see what he, he paid for the whole place. What he, he, he bought the farm. He bought the whole farm. Okay? So... That's the contradictions in the Bible. So what is the applications here? What is the application? So there's two reasons, two main reasons, that David sinned for numbering the people. And the first one is, look, lack of faith in God. That's the first sin that David committed here. Now look, you say, is lack of faith a sin? Turn to Proverbs chapter, thir chapter 3. I'm glad you asked. Is lack of faith, like if you have lack of faith in your life, I mean, is that a literal sin? Let's look at that. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Look, trust means, you know, have total faith. Right? And look, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart, that means there's zero doubt there. Better. Right? I mean, that is the kind of faith that you need to have on Jesus to be saved. Right? You have to have total faith. It can't be 99.5% Jesus, 0.5% me repenting of my sins. Right? I mean, it doesn't work that way. It's total faith in Jesus. But look, is anyone going to have perfect faith where they trust God with everything in their life, even once they're saved? I mean, look, the Bible says that you should, in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto. So what's the opposite of that? Remember Proverbs is the opposites, right? It says, do this, but don't be this guy, right? It's always talking like that. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. That's where you want to be. And lean not unto thine own understanding. So leaning unto your own understanding is the opposite of trusting in the Lord. Right. Okay, so if I'm sitting here and I'm like, you know, and look, I've committed this sin a lot in my life because I like to like overanalyze things. Right? I like to be like, oh, I got off this big plan and this is the way it's going to go and all this. And like, oops, God's over here. Yep. Right? 
So, look, I mean, that is... But, look, is it a sin is the question. Turn to Romans 14. What if the Bible doesn't tell us? What if we don't know? Guess what? The Bible tells us everything. Amen. Look at Romans 14 and verse 23. Look, the Bible answers everything. And the reason for that, we're going to talk about that a little bit too. But look, look at Romans 14, 23. The Bible says, he's talking about, you know, sacrifice and eating things that have been sacrificed. But look, just look at the statement though. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For, this is the key one right here. For whatsoever is not of faith is what? Is sin. So like, look, if something is not of faith, Something in your life, you're trusting something other than God, it is sin. That is sin. To not trust the Lord is sin. So the answer is, look, David had lack of faith in God, and yes, that one thing alone is a sin. Okay? But look, it, it, it gets worse. It gets worse because what David really messed up on and where you will really get yourself into trouble is right here is when we take action out of lack of faith. David had a lack of faith. He, he wasn't in this place where he's like, whatever, if God has 300 men for me, that'll be good enough to win any battle. That's not where David was. David was leaning on his own understanding. He wanted to see how powerful he was, and he took action on that lack of faith. And that is where God really came down on him. Look, this is where we could get ourselves in trouble too. Like even look, think about Abraham and Sarah, even getting impatient with God. Go to Genesis 16. Even getting impatient with God in your life, you could go and you could make decisions that, were, that are decisions out of lack of faith. And then you will be in serious trouble. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2. Verse number 1. I'm sorry, Genesis 16 and verse number 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go unto my maid, and it may be that I obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So, I mean, this begins all kinds of mess in the Bible right here. Look, they, just, they, had, they were impatient with God's plan for them. And so they decide to take things into their own hands. And she's like, go into my handmaid and have children with... I mean, it just... We don't have time to tell the whole story. But look, it's another train wreck, for sure. All right? I mean, the child doesn't turn out right. Hagar is hated by Sarah. I mean, because there's all this... I mean, just imagine. I'm sure there's jealousy and all these things involved. That's why, you know, like the whole multiple wives thing, guys, it just never worked out well at all. All right? At all. That's why God said, don't multiply wives. And nobody listened. <laughs> I mean, who would want to be in that type of situation? But anyway, look, all sorts of trouble follows from this. So the Bible is rife with stories of men, kings, that are trusting on their own understanding and not the Lord's. And they just get themselves in, and their people, look, David got his people into a lot of trouble here. All right, so the first thing that you need to do as application is you just need to, you just need to take things before the Lord. Amen. Just like Hezekiah did. When he got that, you know, that, that letter from the Assyrian army, when he got that letter, the first thing they did was they laid that letter before the Lord. I mean, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Let's look at somebody who didn't do a good job on this. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Asa. Let's look at King Asa. Asa, look, Asa was a, a, a good king. I mean, he was a, a faithful king. He did well for his life. But at the end of his life, he made a crucial mistake and he didn't trust the Lord. And in verse number 12, it says, And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Look, I mean... It doesn't even really say that the problem was the physicians. If the problem was he, he sought not the Lord. So, I mean, here he just he operated outside of his faith and he just trusted something else and, and he just died. He died. 
I mean, remember Hezekiah? He just, he asked the Lord, and God gave him another 15 years. Asa just died because he didn't trust the Lord. Okay? So look, you, you need to keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. You need to pray. You need to lay it before the Lord. You need to let God work it out. Amen. Let the Lord lead you. But look, when we start taking matters into our own hands is when we will get led in a non-godly direction. Then we will find trouble. It's like when we try to force situations. Now, the biggest example that I can think of this is people that, that try to force situations with like money or wealth in their life. Where they're like, you know what, I just need to just, I just need to make this kind of money and get to this point in my life. I mean, look, it's good to go to work and we're commanded to do all those things and, and all this, but look, where people are just like, I, if I just get to this point right here, then I can just serve the Lord with my life. And then they just, they just they forsake the Lord in this, in this pursuit of this wealth that one day they're going to use for the Lord or something. And they, they just leave God in the dust and it just never works out well. They get backslidden and you just never hear from them again. Most of them. Yeah. But look, the second reason, the second reason, so we see that lack of faith and taking action on that lack of faith was David's major problem. But the second one was this. His, his second major problem was his pride. Was David's pride. Now, I understand that sermon series could be preached on pride. It's a huge topic in the Bible. But look, here's the thing. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Just think of the slap in the face to God that that was. You know, he had this lack of faith in God. I mean, God could do whatever he wanted. And instead, you know, he, he acts on lack of faith. But then, you know, he also just wants to know how powerful he is. He wants to know how powerful he is. But here's the thing. Here's the irony of that situation. Look at Romans 8.31. The Bible says, what shall the, we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Look, David, he's got the heart that everybody wants. He's got the heart that every he already had that heart. I mean, God was for him. God was for David, but he wanted to just show how powerful he was. He wanted the glory for himself. This is his pride. This is David's pride. And look, it, it, it's it, it, it cost him here. And it cost the whole nation. So you say, you know, I get it. You know, I understand what you're saying, you know, but as far as me, you're like, you know, God doesn't really lead me. You know, God doesn't, you know, how am I supposed to have faith in God when God doesn't like speak to me audibly, right? So if God speaks to you audibly, first of all, you know, we need to talk. <laughs> or talk to my wife, if you're a lady and God is speaking to you audibly, okay? But let me ask you a question. You ever thought about this? Because like, look, God is speaking to Gad here. He's like, the Lord said this. The Lord spoke to Moses. He said, the Lord spoke to Moses. Go number the people. I mean, it was pretty clear, right? So why doesn't God speak to us audibly? Have you, I mean, have you ever wondered that? Why doesn't God speak to us audibly? I'm going to explain it to you. Look, first of all, if God spoke to you audibly, I mean, how often do you read the Bible? You're like, ah, uh, you're trying to think of the last time that you read the Bible right now, aren't you? But the thing is, if God spoke to you audibly, would you ever read the Bible? I mean, why would you? If God just like has a personal phone call to me for like three hours a day, why would I ever read the Bible? Imagine how many individual conversations he'd have to have on a regular basis if he spoke to us audibly, right? But look, here's the thing. He gives us a Bible which is everything. Look, God doesn't have anything else to say to you other than this. What more is there to say? I mean, I was joking when I said, like, hey, I wonder if the Bible tells us if that's a sin. Of course it does, because it tells you everything. The Bible tells you everything. Look, he gives you a Bible, which is everything. He's like, that's all I have to say to you. He gives you a church. He gives you godly counsel. He gives you pastors. He gives you teachers. It's like... Do you even use the tools that you've been given? I mean, look, I know the Bible, you know, look, you'll never find a book 
that people claim to know so much when they've never even read even a fraction of it. It's crazy. I mean, it's, the, it's the craziest thing in the world. Because like nobody, nobody would ever do that with any other book because it would just be stupid. It would just be dumb. Like if you've read like, you know, you're like, oh, you know, David Copperfield, this is such a good book. Who would walk into a room and start talking about like David Copperfield? You ever seen David Copperfield? It's like 800 pages long or something, right? I mean, who would ever read that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I mean, the point is, who would ever go into a room of people who have like read that book before and start talking about it like they've read it when they've never even read one page? Yeah, people do it with the Bible all the time. They just claim to know all about it. You know it. You go out soul winning. People claim to know the Bible so well, and they know nothing about it. They're misquoting things. All the doctrine's wrong. They're just regurgitating what some stupid false prophet has told them about the Bible. They've never opened it once, most of these people. So look, this is how you know what to do. You see what I'm saying? But you have the responsibility to pray, bring your, you know, your concerns before the Lord, lay that letter before the Lord, and read what he's told you. Because he's given you, look, he's like, he's said everything already. You know, all these men from the Old Testament, they don't have, they didn't have what you have. They didn't have God's complete word. Turn to Psalm 25. You're like, I have to read the whole Bible to understand, like, how to be, well, you know, you should know what the Bible says. That's your responsibility. Look at Psalm 25 and verse number, 20, and verse number 5. The Bible says, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. But how will he lead me? How will he lead me? Look, I used to have this friend who just, and we were both unsaved at the time, but we were religious and all this. And like this friend used to talk in a certain way that would just, just irritate the living daylights out of me. Because he'd always say things like, well, I just feel like the Lord is leading me to, you know, every decision that he made in his life, he's like, the Lord just led me, in the, you know, to go. In. Look, he's just taking what decision he wanted to make and just saying, the Lord led me. You know, like he's got this, this branch and he's like, oh, right there. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, th this is how the Lord leads you. And look, look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 6. I mean, the Bible says the Lord will literally lead you, okay? And I'm going to show you how right now. This is how God leads you right here. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby, now here's the key. Hereby we know, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So look, the Bible says that if you're saved and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're reading the Bible, it's like God will show you the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So somebody comes and gives you like some, you know, advice that's not, not godly advice, the, the Bible says that you'll know it. That you'll know that that's the spirit of error. So look, I mean, Pray and wait for the spirit of truth to guide you, Amen. is the bottom line. Look, don't, don't force situations you know, on your own understanding. That's, that's, what, that's what David did. He was forcing a situation. He wanted, look, he wanted to rely on himself, and it was a major sin. Major sin. I mean, look, did you notice that, that Satan got him to do it? So what does Satan want people to rely on? Think about it. So when Satan took control of David, what did he get him to rely on? He got him to rely on himself. In this instance, not on you know, his faith, his saving faith. But he got him to rely on himself for his strength, for his power, instead of God. That's a nice step. Look, that's a nice step. If Satan can get you pulled away from God and just start trusting in your own understanding, he's doing pretty well against you, saved Christian. I remember when we first moved to Sacramento, and it was one of the first times I ever met Vladi. I don't know if you guys know Vladi from Sacramento. All right? Look, Vladi built... Look, as far as, as, far as 
as far as go-getters, hardworking, get-her-done type of people, I've not met his equal. I mean, he built this pulpit. He built the stage that I'm standing on in like five minutes. I mean, it's like, done. But look, I remember I was soul winning with Lottie one of the first times I met him, and he said something that just stuck with me. And we were talking about soul winning and all this, and look, Lottie, he's, a, he's, a, he's got a business. He's, he's very successful by most people's standards. He works super hard. And you could look at a guy like Vladi and just be like, yeah, he's successful because he works super hard. But he said to me one day, we were talking about soul winning and just finding the time to make sure we go soul winning once a week. And he's like, you know what? He's like, it wasn't even a question for him because he's like, I can't afford not to, is what he said to me. I mean, Vladi says to me, I can't afford not to go soul winning. Because look, even as somebody who is accomplished as him, as skillful, as motivated, as him. He knows he needs God working with him. Right, he knows that. He's not going to step out on his own understanding and just be like, I'm just going to get this done myself. No, he was smarter than that. And he knows that he needs God working with him. So we need to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. We need to be out there doing what we're supposed to be doing as hard as we can possibly do it. But look, we need God with us. We need to not trust on our own understanding. We just need to do, because look, guess what? Getting out there, working hard, and doing what you're supposed to be doing, like he does, like a lot of you do, like, we, like I do. Look, it's what the Bible tells us we're supposed to be doing. But don't let that make you just think that you're doing it all on your own. Don't end up making this mistake that David, you know, where he wanted to trust in his army and not the Lord. Because look, it's a huge mistake. And, and that's why this train wreck is in the Bible to show us that, you know, when you act out of unbelief, out of lack of faith, it's a huge error. And many people are going to suffer from it, not just you. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.